Good morning, Park Avenue. It's nice to see everyone this morning. My name's Braden. Uh, before we dive into worship, I have uh, a quick announcement. First off, online, we're so glad you guys are joining us for worship today. We hope you're blessed. Um, so this week is Holy Week. Today is Palm Sunday, which is the day that Jesus came into Jerusalem. And everyone tossed the palms at his feet uh, as he's riding actually on the donkey. And uh, they were crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. And that started the process of uh, when Jesus would eventually get to the cross, and that would be Good Friday this week. So uh, this week, what we have is something new. Uh, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, we have an experience called Walk with Christ to the Cross. And I want you to see what this looks like, uh, because we've never done it before. But basically, there's 40 stations. Each station has one item that uh, Jesus experienced on the way to the cross or while on the cross. And um, this is something my dad did uh, in the youth ministry when he was a youth pastor and I was in high school. And I shared this with Heart and Soul uh, on Monday this week, but I remember going in on a Wednesday night, the first time he was introducing it, and I wasn't feeling super spiritual. I'm sure we can relate, but I just, uh, I was not really wanting to be a youth group that week. And I went in and was ready to go home, but I came out I came out of that experience completely changed because I realized that Jesus paid such a price for me and it became so personal and real to me what he actually experienced and went through on the cross for me and for you. And so I wanted to create this opportunity for us as a church to uh, invite people in our lives to come and walk with Christ to the cross to see the things he really experienced. So I invite you, if you have time on Wednesday or Thursday between 5.30 and 8.30 p.m., uh, you can come and experience these stations. And um, we've got lots of different things in there. But then also on Good Friday itself, you can come from 5.30 to 7.30. And then we're gonna come in here for a time of worship, our Good Friday night of worship from 7.30 to 8.30. So uh, I would invite you guys to go through it yourselves. And if you have children and you want them to experience it, I would recommend parents that you go through it first just to make sure that it's at the level that your kids are ready for. Uh, It is graphic. It's truly what Jesus experienced. So I'll let you guys be the the judge of that, but go through it, discern if that's something your your kids are ready for. Um, And then experience the cross, experience what Jesus really paid for us. A few weeks ago, our media director, Zach, handed all the directors some of these cards. He gave us two each and he said, my challenge to you is for you to personally hand out two of these cards and invite someone, a family member, a friend. And we loved it. Um, And it it was really cool. I I got to give some to my neighbors in my neighborhood. And um, I thought, what a great way for us to be evangelists and to be, be out there and invite people to hear the gospel. So our challenge to you guys from the directors is go grab one of these. If you don't have one already, grab them on the way out in the lobbies and pray and ask God for a name. Ask him, who do I need to give this to? Whether it's a friend or a family member, a coworker, whoever it may be, ask God, he'll tell you a name. It's normally pretty quick and be bold. Give this flyer to them and invite them to come. There is a gospel presentation in the Walk with Christ experience. At the very end, it's the last table. If people go through it and they don't know Jesus, uh, we have some scripture. It's the Romans Road. And then we have a prayer that they can pray to receive Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. So they will have the gospel preached uh, in that way. And we would love for you guys to be the laborers. We want, we have the responsibility and uh, Billy shared it at heart and soul, but we get the opportunity to go out and be the laborers for the harvest. So that's our challenge. Can we do it church? Can we grab one of these? Can we go out and love on our community and invite them to experience the Jesus that we know? Yes. yes. Awesome. All right. Well, let's stand up. Let's praise our King this morning. Lord, you're worthy of our praise today. We thank you for your cross and we thank you for your mercy and your love towards us today. Oh, praise is rising. Eyes are turning to you. We turn to you. Yes, hope is stirring.
yes Lord and in your presence all our fears are washed away when we see cause when we see you we find strength to face the day and in your presence all our fears are
hearts today, that we would receive the seed that you have for us, that the truth would be planted, and that it would grow forth for your kingdom. And all of God's children said, amen. It is good to worship amongst you guys today. Well, take a moment, share your name with someone around you, and welcome them to Park Avenue.
Good morning. I'm Zach Unruh, the media director here at Park Avenue. I just want to take a quick moment to say welcome. I'm so glad you're here on this Palm Sunday. If this is your first time here, or if you want to learn more about our church, take a few moments during the service today to fill out the connection card in the seat back in front of you. At the end of the service, come to the launch pad in the back of the sanctuary. We've got a $10 gift card for you just to say thanks for coming today. This is the week. On Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, head to the Recreation Building to experience the journey of Jesus to the cross and the hands-on experience, Walk with Christ to the Cross. Then Friday at 7.30 p.m. will be the Good Friday Night of Worship, where we'll continue to reflect on the profound sacrifice that Jesus made for us and worship together. Then on Sunday morning, we'll celebrate our risen Lord at 9.15 and 11 a.m. in our Resurrection Sunday services. Also, this year we'll be celebrating with water baptisms in both services on Resurrection Sunday. And I just wanted to take a quick moment and encourage you. If you've been thinking about water baptism or even just want to know more, stop by the launch pad or sign up at parkavenue.org slash baptism and someone from the church will reach out to you. It's so much more than just a symbolic act. This act of obedience is a bold declaration of your faith, a tangible step as we live a life transformed by the love of Christ. When I was baptized, I can remember that moment coming out of the water reminded that I'm not alone. I'm surrounded by a community of believers cheering me on. And I remember just having a new awakening to walk in abundant life. The deadline to sign up is this Wednesday. Speaking of believers cheering you on, we have a Christian Community Next Steps class beginning on April 7th. Living a successful Christian life alone is difficult, and this class aims at helping you make connections at church while offering practical teaching on relationships and practicing community in the class. Sign up at parkavenue.org slash next steps or stop by the launch pad. As we prepare to pray over the offering, I just wanted to think back on the messages from the last two Sundays. We're talking about love. In both weeks, we opened with 1 Corinthians 13, where in verse 3 it says, If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. You could give all you have away, but if it's not done with love, it's for nothing. Love isn't just a suggestion, it's actually a commandment, the greatest commandment to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. The amount of money, time, or talents isn't what's important. It's about your heart. Let's give out of love for what He's done for us, not obligation. As a reminder, there are three ways to give. Cash or check at the end of the service on your way out, online at parkavenue.org slash give, or you can text to give. The ways to give can also be found on the offering envelope in the seat back in front of you. You may have also noticed the new giving stations in the lobbies. These stations have been in process for a while now and are there to offer a seamless and secure way to give. Let's pray. God, as we worship today with our tithes and our offerings, I just want to thank you for sending your son to die for us. I just want to thank you for all the blessings you've given us, God. We just thank you for your word. Thank you for the life that it brings. Search us, God. Know our hearts. Help us to give in love today. We just thank you that no matter what we give, no matter how big, no matter how small, God, it'll make a difference in your kingdom. We just pray a blessing on this offering, and we pray it gives you all the glory. In your mighty name, amen. Okay, good morning. <laughs> My name is Billy Durham, and this guy follow me. I'll tell you about him in a minute, okay? Uh, we're so glad you're here today. Welcome online people again. Let's give them a welcome. We're so happy people uh, have a whole another church online uh, with us today and worshiping. And so we're glad to be, glad you're here as well online. And thank you for being with us again. I just love that guy, Zach Unruh. Don't you? He's an incredible guy, our media director. He's unreal. He's, he's, he's a blessing. He's a real blessing. Well, before I introduce our guest speaker, uh, I would like to share something on behalf of the elders. Uh, the elder, here's what I'd like to share. The, the elders retreat from this weekend went very well. First, the elders would like to say thank you for your prayers for them. Your prayers were felt, and they made a difference. There was a t this was a time of prayer for prayer, worship, fellowship, and seeking the Lord's face and his will in unity. It was also a time for sharing thoughts and impressions for now and for the next steps. One decision from the retreat was the formation of the pastor search committee that will consist of some current elders, some former elders, and some lay leaders. 
More details um, will be announced as they become available. But for now, the elders mainly just wanted to give a brief report and say thank you very much for your prayers, as well as to please continue to pray for them, the pastor search committee, and this process. So we appreciate that so much. And as you know, if you've been a part of our membership class uh, and you've heard about our churches, how, how we're set up, we believe in New Testament uh, apostolic covering and the New Testament apostolic ministry. And God has given us uh, two apostles to whom we look for correction, edification, exhortation, and encouragement. And although the apostles do not have any governing authority over the church, they do provide shepherding. Uh, support to the elders in our church by praying, counseling, instructing, and spiritually leading us well, when we ask, when asked or when asked or needed. Uh, so uh, this uh, person we're going to have today share with us. He had Alan Smith three weeks back. He's one of our apostles. And Bill Jones today is coming to share with us. Uh, Bill Jones is a wonderful person. Uh, he's been a part of this church for years. He's going to tell you a story today. He's been a blessing to my life for over 30 years. Uh, he's spoken to my life, encouraged me, uh, challenged me in the Lord. And so I'm excited to have Bill Jones, who's president of Columbia International University. Let's welcome Bill Jones today. Thank you, Bill. Billy, before you turn your mic off, who, who officiated your wedding? Bill Jones officiated my wedding. Yeah, yeah. Now, you know, I think I'm in the wedding business. And watch this. Um, I, I think I can prove I've been part of 10% of all the weddings of the people here this morning. Now, now watch. We take a sampling, right? Back in that back section, I guesstimate less than 40 people in that back section. So Dave and Tammy Tucker, would you two stand up? Who was part of your wedding? Oh, I, oh uh, Eric and Linda Ball, would you stand up please? Uh, who was part of your wedding? Oh my goodness. So, uh, so if they take that sampling and go through here, I've been part of 10% of all the weddings of, of the church. So you're, you're welcome, you're welcome. And, and they stick too, right? So uh, Dave's one of our elders. Uh, Eric was the youth minister for 14 years. 13, uh, I'm an evangelist, we exaggerate. What, what can I say? So if you're taking notes this morning, I want you to write this down, please. I want you to write, if you don't write anything down, I want you to write this date down. It's very important, today's date. March 24th, 2024. March 24th, 2024. Let me tell you why it's important. It's important, very important for two reasons. Reason number one is today is Palm Sunday, which represents a historic event almost a little over 2,000 years ago. I say approximately 2,000 years ago. Now, Palm Sunday marks a countdown, which Braden, we saw, we can call it a walk to the cross but I'm gonna give a little longer runway because Palm Sunday is seven day countdown to Easter Sunday. So let's watch how this works. If you take the four books, first four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you add up all the chapters in those four books, and then you take the chapters devoted to Palm Sunday to Easter Sunday, about 30%, a little bit more, 30% of all the chapters in the first four books of the New Testament are devoted to these eight days, the seven-day countdown, and then Easter Sunday. Let me just give you a quick walk to the cross to whet your appetite for perhaps going to the walk to the cross we're having here at the church. Let's start with today. 2,000 years ago, Palm Sunday. And let's take the Gospel of Mark. See, if you're taking notes, you have to do it very, very quickly, okay? So Mark chapter 11 starts with Palm Sunday. Why do we call it Palm Sunday? I call it the triumphal entry where Jesus comes to Jerusalem and they're expecting the Messiah. They put palm branches like these on the road and their clothes. And that was a gesture they only did that with kings, and they believe the king of the Jews is coming, the Messiah. And this is a fulfillment of Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, and he will come mounted on a colt, the, uh, mounted on a donkey, the fold of a donkey. 
Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. Still in chapter 11, Mark, we get to Monday. Monday's the cleansing of the temple. It's the second time Jesus has cleansed the temple. He cleansed at the beginning of his ministry in John chapter 2. And for the second time, that three-year, three-and-a-half-year interval was enough time for the selling of the doves and the changing of the money to creep back into the temple. So he cleanses the temple a second time on Monday. Still in Mark chapter 11, we get to Tuesday. Tuesday, I call it the Q&A day. I call it that because the bad guys asked Jesus four questions. The good guys asked Jesus two questions. So this is chapter 11, 12, 13. Mark chapters 11, 12, and 13. So those four questions the bad guys ask, they're trying to trap him. And if they can trap him in what he says, then they can see him eliminated because he's encroaching upon their power base. The people are following him and not them. So they ask him, number one, should we pay taxes to Caesar or not? So we got him. Whichever way he goes, we got him. If he says no, the Romans will get him. If he says yes, the, he, the Jews will be so mad, they will get him. He says, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar and render unto God the things of God. So then they say, okay, the Sadducees come. The Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection. And they say, ah, oh, here's a question that'll get him. So they're trying to ask these questions like, uh, Billy, have you stopped? I know you have. Dennis, have you stopped beating your wife? <laughs> yes or no? No? Well, you're, you're, well, well, why not? Or yes, well, congratulations. But, but now, we don't want him teaching the Bible because he's beating his wife. It's, it's a trick question. So they say, ah, there was this woman. She married seven men at different times. Married this one, he died. Married this one, he died. These are brothers. Married this. You know, I think they'd get the point after a while. Mary the fourth and he died. Mary the fifth and he died. Mary the sixth and he died. Mary the seventh and he died. Then she dies. So they say, in the resurrection, which one is she married to? And he says, don't you understand the scripture? There's, there's no marri marrying or there's no marriage or given in marriage in heaven. You need to understand the scripture. So they get to the third question. The scribe comes up and goes, oh, here's a question. What's the greatest commandment in the law? They're all important, right? Is there one that's more important? And to Dennis's last two services, last two Sundays, he's, Jesus, this fast, he says, you can summarize it all in two commandments. And he quotes Deuteronomy chapter six, verse five. And he quotes Leviticus chapter, where is it, 18, 17? Some, just nod your head. Okay, yeah. Um, and he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. That, that covers them all. And so then the fourth one was, he says, all right, here's, here's a question. He says, um, who gave you the authority to cleanse the temple yesterday? He says, well, let me ask you a question first. Was John the Baptist from heaven or from earth? So he asked a question. He says, you answer mine, then I'll answer yours. And they go, well, if we say John the Baptist uh, was from God, he's gonna ask us, why didn't we believe in him? If we say no, the people will stone us. So he just flipped the tables on them. So I call it Q&A day. Wednesday, we don't know for certain, but it appears, and this would be, now we're getting into Mark chapter 14. It appears this could have been the day that Judas forms the plot to betray Jesus. Then we get to Thursday. Thursday is definitely chapter 14. In chapter 14, or on Thursday, we find a lot of major events. There's the Last Supper, okay? Then after the supper, they go to this place called the Garden of Gethsemane. And then there's the betrayal. Jesus is arrested. And there are two trials, two religious trials and they convict Jesus and condemn him to death but it's not allowable under Jewish law to condemn to have a trial at night so they have to wait till Friday morning and so now we're getting to chapter 15 and in chapter 15 there are four more trials one to confirm he's guilty of death and then they go to the from the religious trials to the civil trials 
under Pilate and Herod and Pilate again. And so now Pilate condemns him to death. They take him to Golgotha and he's crucified. Jesus is crucified on the cross. They take him down from the cross. He's buried in the grave Saturday morning. Now we're, uh, we're getting to um, the beginning of chapter 16. Except this is not in Mark. That's why I'm stuttering. In Matthew, Saturday morning, they place guards at the tomb. They don't do it Friday night, Friday afternoon. They do it Saturday morning. And then Saturday night, this is Mark chapter 16 now, back to Mark chapter 16. We have the women buy spices after sundown because they couldn't do it before sundown. It was still the Sabbath. It's on Saturday. They buy spices and then chapter, the rest of chapter 16, the next morning, Sunday morning, what we call Easter morning, but I like calling it resurrection morning, they're going to go anoint the body of Jesus to prepare him for the burial. And as we know, the rest of the story, chapter 16, they find the stone rolled away because Easter morning, Jesus burst forth the stone was not rolled away to let him out. The stone was rolled away so we could see in and see it's empty. So today, March 24th, 2024, 2,000 years later, we are celebrating. And by the way, on Friday, if, if Sunday on the donkey was Zechariah 9.9, 9, Friday was Zechariah 12.10. Zechariah is filled with prophecies about the coming Messiah. 1210 says, the inhabitants of Jerusalem looked upon him whom they had pierced. And that was 500 years before the coming crucifixion. So today is important for a second reason. It doesn't mark something special from 2000 years ago, but it marks something very special to me that happened 50 years ago Today, exactly today, 50 years ago, March 24th, 1974, I got down on my knees. It was 20 degrees below zero, Iowa State University. I don't know why I was there, but I was. I invited Jesus to come into my heart. And this morning, of all mornings, the elders asked me to come speak. And I thought, oh my I want to talk about Jesus, but I want to talk about Jesus from the perspective of this is what he's done in my life and how much Park Avenue Baptist Church has played in that process. You see, this church is in the life-changing business. And you, God, has been using you for five and a half years decades to change lives by proclaiming the message of the resurrected Jesus. He wasn't left on the cross. He wasn't left in the tomb. He left that. He overcame death. He overcame darkness. He overcame despair. And he proclaims a message of victory and this church, I want you to understand, sometimes we go through rough waters, right? Sometimes we go through hard times, but we have to keep our focus. And our focus needs to be on Jesus Christ and he is using us here to change lives just like mine. And understand, I just represent perhaps thousands and thousands of other people that God, through you, have changed. So with your permission, please don't walk up and leave. I mean, just, uh, 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 with your permission, I would love to share my story. So it starts, my story can be summarized in 321s, 321s. First is the number of people that were in my family growing up. Four grandparents, two parents, one sibling, myself, three aunts, three uncles, seven cousins. If I have my math right, that's 21. And that 21 
We were unchurched, non-Christian, very dysfunctional. We had four alcoholics in that 21. One died of crystal meth addiction. Um, we have four marital infidelity. Four ended up in mental health hospitals. I mean, it was just very dysfunctional. Two committed suicide. 10% of my family committed suicide. And that doesn't count spouses or uh, great uncles and, and other people. Suicide was prevalent in our family, 21 of us. And growing up, I decided very early in life, I did not want to be like my family. But we didn't go to church. Never had a chance to hear the message of Easter, of resurrected power, of life everlasting, of complete and total forgiveness of sins. I never had that opportunity to hear. So, growing up, well, I don't know why I'm so big on statistics this morning. About 25% of the family lived in our house. It was a two-bedroom house. You go to the end of the hallway like this. On the left, one of my grandmothers lived because the grandfather had passed. Uh, that's where she slept. On the right, my mother and my sister slept in that bedroom at night because my dad worked at the railroad during the day. So when he came home the morning, he would sleep there. My 17-year-old cousin and his 15-year-old wife, they slept on the fold-out couch in the, what we call the living room. And then in the den, my 15-year-old cousin and I slept in the den. He was older than I by seven years. And so he slept, he slept on the couch. I slept on the floor. That's where we grew up. And I looked at all this dysfunction. The two cousins and the wife lived at our house because their parents had, their brothers, their parents had died at age 42 from alcoholism. And I'm looking at all this and like, there has to be something different. So when I was age 13, I started going to this monastery, a Catholic monastery, 13.3 miles from our house. And my dad would take me down there, dump me off, come back. That would be like on a Friday. Sunday, he would go back and get me, bring me back. I went so often, they gave me a room of my very own. It was in the barn. It was in the, the loft of the barn. It had electricity, it had heat, had no air conditioning. I grew up in Atlanta and it's just awful. I went so often they gave me a job to do when I came. And my job was to collect the eggs from all the chicken houses. Now, if you're ever offered that job, politely but firmly turn it down. <laughs> Not only do they peck the fire out of your hand, and I found out last service, Dennis gave me permission, uh, I can say the word poop. Um, <laughs> all over my hand and my arm. It was horrible, but I'm looking for something. But the monks just weren't able to communicate. When I was 15, I wasn't old enough to drive legally, but my dad was tired of carrying me down there. I would drive down there. That's why I knew it was 13.3 miles from our home. And I did that until I went to college and then the first semester of college. But at college, God introduced three students there I went to school in Atlanta, it's Georgia Tech, and these three students began to share the gospel with me. And what is the gospel? The gospel is the good news of Easter. It's the good news of Jesus Christ, and it has four parts to it. And it's easy to remember, it's up, down, up, down. God's purpose, man's problem, God's remedy, man's response. God loves us completely, totally. But, I, but my problem, that's his purpose. He wants a love relationship with us. Love the Lord and God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength. But I have a problem. I've disobeyed him. But there's a remedy. Back up. The remedy is Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay the penalty of my disobedience. But it's back down. Man's response. We have to respond. To not respond is to respond. And we respond by faith asking him to come into our lives, to forgive us of our disobedience, to give us the free gift of eternal life and the power through his Holy Spirit to become the people he created us to become. And they shared the gospel with me over and over and over again, but I didn't get it. And I didn't get it because there was this, there was this delusion, this deception that if I can just be good enough, then I'll be accepted into heaven. But guess what? That's, that, that, that's the ultimate in arrogance because we can't be good enough to stand before a holy God in our own righteousness. So 
they shared the gospel, these three friends. And then one of them invited me to his home in Franklin, North Carolina. And his father was a doctor. And at lunch that day, I went to Georgia Tech on a wrestling scholarship. But I never competed because I was showing off. It was my fault. Showing off in the gym, doing dislocations on a high bar. And I used to do them very easily. But after the last tournament, in eight days, I gained 22 pounds. And it was all up here. And, and I still have it except it's all down here, okay? <laughs> so I ripped my rotator cuffs and I was in a lot of pain. And his dad at breakfast the next morning says, your shoulders hurt a lot, don't they? I said, yes, sir. He said, I'm a doctor, but I know the doctor of doctors and he can heal your shoulders if you'd let him. And it's like, yes, sir. I'm like, he's talking some strange language. He said, do you care if I pray for your shoulders? No, sir, I don't. He gets up from the table, comes around behind me, and Braden, he puts his hands on my shoulders and starts praying for me out loud. And I'm thinking, I'm with a bunch of nuts. Because I didn't grow up in that. And as he's praying, I'm thinking, what can I tell him? It's like, well, thank you, but nothing happened. That fast, my shoulders quit hurting. And they've never hurt since. I mean, from the, you know, if I do something dumb, I mean, they're, they're not bionic, but it, um, they never hurt from the rotator cuff injuries. So that fast, God changes me on the outside. So I know he's real and I know I'm closing in on it, but I still don't get it. I get back to school. My mother calls me. She's in Piedmont Hospital, about three miles away from the school. And she says, will you come visit me in the hospital? Of course. So I get in my car, go down the three miles. And I, it, I don't remember what was her problem, but it was life-threatening, the surgery. And she says to me, my mother, how do I know if I'm going to, going to go to heaven or hell if I die? And I'm like, why are you asking me? I've been wondering that question for years. But I was, quote, the spiritual one because I went to the monastery. So I said, I don't know, Mom, but let me go back to my room and get one of these little yellow booklets that these guys keep reading to me. How many remember the four spiritual laws? So I go get one. I had a drawer full of them. And I came back and I said, Mom, just as there are physical laws in the universe, there are also spiritual laws. Law number one, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. She goes, Really? Yes, ma'am. Law number two, you're sinful and separated from God. She goes, I know that. Law number three, Jesus Christ died on the cross to forgive the penalty of your disobedience. Really? Yes, ma'am. Law number four, it's not enough to know these previous three laws, but you must ask Jesus Christ to come into your heart to receive his forgiveness and his love. She goes, how do I do that? Hang on. Now turn the page and it says, you need to pray this prayer. Well, what is it? It says, dear God. And she goes, dear God, thank you for loving me. Thank you for loving me. Please come into my heart. Please come into my heart. In Jesus' name I pray. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. That fast, my mother's changed, but not on the outside like I had been with my shoulders, but on the inside because the Holy Spirit came and indwelled her life. And that fast changed her. That's right. Praise God. Now I know I'm really getting close. So the thing I knew I needed to do was go into full-time ministry. So I become a staff member for Youth for Christ, which is like Young Life, if you know that. And they're paying me $25 a week to talk about Jesus. I don't know who he is, but, you know, I figured this has to be it. So then the school asked me to go to Iowa, Georgia Tech, asked me to go to Iowa State University. I, I promise, I do not remember why. Uh, maybe just get rid of it, you know? So, so I go to Iowa State University and I meet this charismatic Lutheran pastoring a Methodist church as a 21-year-old student at Iowa State University. I have it all in my background. And he says, ask one question that navigates my mental roadblocks. He says, have you ever made Jesus Christ Lord of your life? That made sense. I said, no. He said, would you like to? I said, yes. I'm the first person he ever led to Christ. And I'm expecting, well, you have my phone, baby. Debbie, not you, Billy. Um, <clears throat> 
50 years, he's called or texted, checking on me. So we went to this little chapel. It's 20 degrees below zero, two o'clock in the morning. I got on my knees and invited Jesus into my heart. And I experienced Easter inwardly. Baby doll, uh, come up here, please. This is my wife, uh, Debbie Jones. Would you welcome her, please? (laughs) Park Avenue's changed my life. Park Avenue's had a big impact on my sweetie's life. Would you share, please? Yes. Yes, what a different household I grew up in than my husband. Um, My sister was uh, Diane Welch is... Wave your hand, Diane, please. (laughs) Is Diane Welch. And we grew up in a home with love and... um, Uh, May I interrupt? Put that Bible slide or picture of... This is my Bible, the King James Bible I had all those years at the monastery. And I had it with me at Iowa State University. I'd run it through from literally from cover to cover and didn't understand one single word, but I knew it was magic. And if I kept doing these incantations enough, something might happen. Thank you, baby. I love this story. Um, And mine is profoundly different because we grew up in love and attending a church and our grandparents were believers and our parents were believers, but I had never responded to the gospel personally. And when I was nine, we had a brand new baby brother in our home, David Pugh. And my sister and I and my mom and dad were just enthralled with this firstborn son or this only son of my father. And I went to a kid's Bible clubhouse and they gave us the opportunity to hear John 3.16 in such a way that children can understand. And when I talked to the counselor, I wanted to respond to this love But they said, take this Bible verse and put your name in here. So I began, for the first time, putting my name in the scriptures that were written for me and to me. And I said, Debbie, God loves you so much that he gave his only son. That powerful illustration for me of a newborn baby, would my father give his son? What a love. And I responded to that love, and I asked Jesus to come into my life to forgive me of my sin. I understood sin, even at nine, and be my Lord and Savior. So um, when I was 13, unlike my husband, he was seeking. I was growing in my faith, and I learned that not only did I have salvation, but also he needed to be Lord actively of my life. And I began to continue to read God's word and put my name in the Bible verses I read, and on habitual way, fall in love with the God who wrote love letters to me. And Psalm 1611, Debbie, I will show you the path of life. In my presence is fullness of joy, and at my right hand are pleasures forever. And in the margin, I put, what more could a girl want? And as I, as I got older, I realized I wanted some more answers to some more questions, like, If I were to get married, how would I know who it should be? And through God's word and reading and learning and journaling, I realized I wanted the only indicator for marrying someone would be that the two of us, that the two of us together could be stronger and give more glory to God than each of us individually. And so, of course, I looked for a scripture verse to identify that. How could I describe my purpose to, to him when I met him? And the verse he gave me was, Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together, Psalm 34, 3. And that would be the purpose statement for our relationship. And the funny thing is the romantic in me said, Oh, Lord, it would be so fun if the man that I met would give me that verse. So, Debbie finished school, came here to this church, and she was teaching 10th grade girls during Sunday school. And I was still at Georgia Tech, just two weeks away from graduating, and we both end up 
Debbie with a group from Park Avenue and I as a volunteer staff at this conference in Asheville, North Carolina. So one of our mutual friends, he lived in um, Winter Park, Florida, Orlando. He came up to me and he said, and he pointed at Debbie and he said, you see that girl over there? She's the godliest woman I've ever met. Well, my head comes up because I'm a brand new Christian, about two and a half years old in the Lord, and I wanted to date a godly woman. So I did my homework, and I learned that in the afternoon, she walked hand in hand with the junior high youth minister from this church. And if some of you may remember Mac Williams, okay? Super guy, godly guy. He's a pastor today. So as they were walking, I needed to get her attention, get her attention off of him, onto me. <laughs> Not knowing, having a lot of experience dating godly women, I just defaulted to kind of what had worked in the past. So I ripped my shirt off. <laughs> and I go running this course that would go back and forth in front of her, trying to get her attention. Well, Men, younger men, take it from me. That doesn't work with a godly woman. <laughs> so she comes back here. I finished two weeks of school. Two weeks later, a month after meeting, not meeting her, but seeing her, trying unsuccessfully to meet her, I'm January the 2nd, 1977. I'm here on staff at Park Avenue. It had been in the works. It was God's providence. And I sat just about where you were, no, the row behind you because there was a lady where you are and a young six-year-old kid, blonde-headed kid there, and I was very that close to reaching up and choking him <laughs> because he had his feet on the back of that front row. We have different chairs now. They were wooden cues back then. And he took this top and would spin it and stick it in his mom's ear, and I thought, I'm going to take care of this problem right here and now. I'm glad I didn't because I found out later it was John Park Lord, Pastor Lord's <laughs> youngest son. So job security, don't assassinate the pastor's kid. Although he may, might have given me a raise. I don't know. So <clears throat> I'm, the junior, I'm, I'm the senior high pastor, Max the junior high pastor. And one day... I'm turning off lights in the gym upstairs. It's a Saturday night. Church is the next morning. And I hear this lady crying. It was Debbie. She was in her 10th grade Sunday school class praying for the ladies, the girls that would come sit there the next morning. And as she would go from seat to seat, praying for each one by name, she would just weep, asking God to do something special in their hearts. I'm on the out. I peeked in, realized it was Debbie. She never knew this. I leaned against the wall just like this and started praying. Now, now, by the way, I didn't tell you who my roommate was, did I? Mac, her boyfriend. I'm pretty proud of this. <laughs> so I'm praying, God, she is the godliest woman I've ever met. I want to date her. Would you take care of a Mac? <laughs> Amen. I waited downstairs until she left. I turned off the light, locked the door, went home. The next two weeks, I started praying. God, take care of Mac. God, take care of Mac. God, take care. I fasted intermittently, not the whole two weeks, fasted until the day came. I said, now's the day. So I invited Mac to go on a long run with me. It wasn't for murder. It was just to, commu <laughs> it was to communicate. He had to understand a new way of looking at things. So when he was good and tired, I said, Mac, I'm having women problems. And he's such a super guy. He goes, oh, you are. What's wrong? I said, well, I want to date your woman. <laughs> and he goes, we stop. And he goes, you know, the last two weeks when I prayed about 
he's talking. When I prayed about my relationship with Debbie, I felt strongly convicted I was supposed to break up with her. Well, I didn't hesitate. He's a little bit taller than I am. I pointed my finger on his chest. I said, you need to obey God. <laughs> so we took care of him. Now it was just to get her to go out with me. She finally went out with me. We dated several weeks, maybe a couple months, and I said, I like this girl. So one night I took her home from a, a date, took her to the door, she, roommates with Linda Ball, got in her personal space, looked her in the eyes. I said, I like you. How did you respond, sweetie? He took me by surprise, and I said, I'm not supposed to give my heart away, right, between me and the Lord, but he didn't now, really you didn't know tell that. me all this. No, tell I me what you tell. said. Okay, so, so I didn't know what to say. So I said, well, thank you. Thank you very much, and I backed up. <laughs> What was I to say? It wasn't just that. She, she, she backs up and got out of that personal space and said, well, thank you. Thank you very much. I looked at her like, you're from another planet. I was like, this girl is different. And it made me all the more want to date her. So we dated another couple months. And then one afternoon, Friday afternoon, I think Eric and Linda were probably with us and Steve Swan, you and Carmen may have been with us and we're headed to, there's Carmen. We're, are you guys having marital problems? <laughs> oh, brother-in-law. Okay. All right. So, <clears throat> driving this bus and Debbie came up to check on me and I, I said, how are you doing? I said, I hate driving. And so, fine. I said, Deb, this morning, God gave me a verse. I want to characterize our friendship. She goes, oh, really? What's the verse? I said, it's Psalm 34, verse 3. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Now, remember what she prayed, you know, Lord, it'd be great if the God that married me would give me that verse first. We get to the retreat place. She gets her girls in the, their, their room and she goes out in the woods by a little creek and she starts crying. She goes, God, I need another verse. <laughs> You're laughing. I'm scarred psychologically from this whole process. And she goes, Bill Jones ruined that verse. I need another verse. So we rock along. That was about the best I could do spiritually. I mean, I'm like in no way in her category at all. So I finally, I finally come to the conclusion I'm supposed to ask her to marry me. I cannot let her get away. So I take her out to a real nice restaurant. I mean, so nice. The chairs moved. I mean, and the menu was not on the wall. It was like one of these things. So we go out to eat and come back and we started walking through the prayer garden. Now, understand, I'd never told her I loved her. We'd never talked about marriage. And I never kissed her. That's not true. I, I, when she wasn't looking twice, just right a couple weeks before we got engaged, she's like, look at that over there. And I, I got it real fast. And so did that twice. I said, no, I can't go there. So we're up there. And we sit on this concrete bench. And it's dirty now. There was a time when the prayer garden got a little overgrown. And we were here visiting a few years ago. And um, Pastor and I were walking in the prayer garden with Deb. We were looking at all the improvements that had been done. And I said, is there a concrete bench here? He goes, yeah, there is. And Debbie says, is it curved? He says, yes, it is. We found it. It was this one. This is where I proposed to her. And I said, I want to buy it. He said, you can have it. I said, no, I don't want anybody to ever think that I took anything from the church. I'm going to buy it. I should have taken up grace. Um, if you're thinking about buying one of these benches for your yard, don't. It cost $800. So 
and it was worth every penny of it. Um, and I would have paid 10 times as much. So then I realized, well, we've never talked about marriage, so I don't have a ring to give her. I mean, you know, I was thinking if she responded the way she did when I said, I like you, if I told her I loved her, she'd probably cut my head off. So why invest in a ring when she's probably gonna say no anyway? And then I realized, oh, she just said yes. I don't have a ring. So I flew back to Atlanta, sold my coin collection, bought a, you, it, no, that's not it. It's somewhere in there. You, you have to look very closely, but it was everything, every cent I owned, I put in that little diamond. Came back, she picked me up at the airport. I took her to another nice restaurant. I gave her the ring, she oohed and odd, and then she gave me this red velvet box. And I'm thinking, I'm not gonna wear a diamond ring. Guys don't do that. I opened it up, trying to think, what can I tell her that doesn't disappoint her? And there was this old key, the ribbon wrapped around it, and it's faded now, but it used to say, the key to my heart. And the note underneath the key said, Dear Bill, this represents the key to my heart. I've never given it to another. I've saved it for you. It's yours to keep. Remember, it's easily broken, but I trust you with it. I love you, Debbie. I got up from the tear, ran around the restaurant going, dun, da, da, dun, da, da, dun, da, da, dun. <laughs> She made me feel like 10 gazillion dollars. Well, then came January the 20th, 1979. And this is a picture of us getting married right here. I mean, this church has had an incredible impact on our lives, an incredible impact. Right here is where I was ordained. And we caught my youngest son, our youngest son, just staring at this picture that's in our bedroom. He's just going. So I said, Stephen, you okay? He said, Dad, did you mean to look that way? <laughs> well, I told you my story, now our story, 321s. The first one I had 21 unchurched, non-Christian, dysfunctional family members. After we married, they told us we'd never have children, but God and his grace, the first three were born December 5th, December 6th, December 7th, different years, but December 5th, <laughs> December... And we had four, so here's Debbie and I, then our four children, they're married now, they're four children, and we have 11 grandchildren. And if my math is correct, it's a new 21. Now, why is it a new 21? Because Easter Sunday came, March 24th, 1974, into my life. And he just didn't change my life. The third 21. Every day we try to pray Isaiah 59, verse 21. Isaiah 59, verse 21. Here's what it says. May your spirit and your word not depart from my mouth or my lips, depending on translation. Not depart from our lips, nor the lips of our offspring, nor the lips of our offspring's offspring, both now and forever. 50 years ago today, when I invited Jesus Christ into my heart, little did I know the impact it would have not just on my life, not just on our relationship, but on our children and our children's children. 
Our four children, the oldest teaches Christian high school, Christian school high school, like Park Avenue School. The next one's her husband is on the board of a mission agency. The next one, she married a pastor. The last one he married, this is good. You need to all have one of these. She's a Christian counselor and I use her all the time for me. But the impact 50 years ago, one simple decision, it wasn't by my righteous works. I don't have any. It's by faith. It's not what I've done, but it's what you've done. Would you take what you've done and apply it to my life? Little did I know 50 years ago that I'd have the privilege of coming down here and serving you for six and a half years. Little did I know that this relationship, I left April 1st, 1983, Little I realize that 40 years later, we would still have a relationship for which I'm extremely grateful because of the role this church has played in changing my life. So remember Park Avenue. We may go through rough times from time to time, turbulent waters, fiery ordeals. We must keep our focus on the resurrected Lord of Easter, because he, through you, Park Avenue is in the business of changing lives. So next Sunday, it's one of two times a year that a lot of people will dare come to church, invite them all. You never know if there's a Bill Jones starving for meaning and purpose and forgiveness an assurance, they're looking. They've just never had a chance to hear the story, the good news, the gospel of a risen Lord Jesus. So invite anything and everything that breathes, bring them. Next week could be life-changing because that's what God's called Park Avenue to do. Even during rough times, God's going to use us for his glory. Let's pray. Now, Father God, thank you for walking us to the cross. Thank you for walking us to the tomb. Thank you for drawing us out into resurrection life. Thank you for your forgiveness, the free gift of eternal life, and the power to live in victory over sin. God, we're thankful. May we be faithful to the Lord of Easter, the risen Savior, the Son of Man, the Son of God, Jesus, the Messiah. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Bill Jones and Debbie. We appreciate you guys so much. Church, let's stand up. Let's continue to worship.
with me here this morning. I'll tell you what, I just want to thank Debbie and Bill for being here today. As, uh, as a young youth pastor, I used to look at you from a distance and said, man, if I can just be half the godly man that he was, I'll have a blessed life. And let me tell you, I look around this room and I see a lot of godly men that has put God first in their life, that has put God first in their marriage, and everything they do, God is number one. And let me tell you what, you can see the effects of it. You can see it moving in this city. You can see it moving in this church. And there is a difference. I really believe in this sanctuary here today, there are other Bill Jones. God's wanting to do something in your life and you've been pushing back and you're saying, I'm close enough to you, God. And God said, no, give it all. Surrender everything. If you'll do that, you'll see God work. You'll see God move. You'll see lives being changed and set free. You'll see other Eric Balls. You'll see other Billy Durham's. I could just go around the room. These young kids that asked Jesus Christ in their lives 50 years ago, and it was step by step, it was inch by inch, it was little by little, but yet they faithfully, over the years, faithfully took that step of obedience. And God is saying to you here today, many of you, you need to take that next step. For some of you here today, you need to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today, not tomorrow, not next week, today you need to say to God say hey listen God I'm so far from you I got so many things going on in my life and he don't want to hear your excuses you say God I'm sorry can you forgive me cleanse me God come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior here right after we get finished this altar is open there will be people here that can pray with you talk with you love on you Whatever you need, they'll be right here. If you need Jesus as your Lord and Savior, man, don't even wait till we say amen. Just run down here. We'll be here. But there's other people here today that you've been a Christian for 30 years and you're in the same spot that you were 10 years ago. And God's saying, hey, it's you. Take that step. Move. Come closer to me. See, God is on the move. God is at work. And he needs every single one of us to complete the mission. Man, thank you all for being here today. Thank you both for being here and coming and visit with us and sharing with us. Y'all just give them a big hand. Just let them have much, know how much we love them. And what we want to do, we just want to close in a word of prayer and then the altars will be open. So let's pray. Father God, we want to thank you for today, for the blessing of life. That life comes from a relationship with Jesus Christ. So Father, just watch over us, protect us, raise us up there, God, challenge us. Just bless your church. Father, we love you, we praise you, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.